two of the chapter 12 on family is going to kind of focus on the history of marriage and family in the United States. Uh, some of these things I lightly touched on in part one, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in part two uh, before then switching over in parts three and four of talking about the five primary changes in family structure um, that have occurred in contemporary society. So let's talk about what U.S. families, what they were like then. Um, so kind of a couple of, of key points for each of the time periods you see here. In pre-industrial agricultural era, um, families were seen as both social and economic units. So families, um, you know, oftentimes produced uh, on their farms, right? You know, they, they both lived and worked on their family farm. So it was a economic unit. Uh, and this represented the fact that a lot of these marriages were based around not necessarily love, but much more kind of practical reasons, um, like the need to adjoin properties or, you know, to strengthen ties with another family. Um, on, on, in these homes, oftentimes there were multiple generations living there. Um, and children, there were a lot of children um, because they were valued for production, right? So they were like your own little mini labor force. Um, the marriages, as already noted, were strategic and they were largely enduring. Um, there was almost no way that a woman could get a, a divorce or out of her marriage. And the options were also extremely limited for, for men to be able to end a marriage as well. These marriages are sometimes called property or patriarchal marriage. Um, property marriage in the sense that women were their husband's property um, and that also is reflected there in the term patriarchal marriage um, in this sense men were the head of household um, in the sense that they were seen as really the the only real adult um, in the in in the household um, women were like property and or children and, th and that concept of, of being treated that way is called coverture when we move into the industrialization, urbanization era at the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, um, which we've talked about in, in, in previous chapters in terms of how it changed society economically, um, it also changed the family. So families shrink during this time because children become more of a cost rather than a wage earning benefit. And this becomes especially true once the United States passes labor laws um, limiting the ability of children to work. Um, so there was no need to have a lot of children um, because it's not like they could help you work the land. Um, instead, you would, you know, you would need to feed them um, and take care of them and, and they would not necessarily offer you much financial benefit. Um, this is where uh, we have the development of separate spheres because you're no longer working your land, your, your family is no longer a a economic unit on its family farm um, you know women are no longer working side by side with their husbands um, instead husbands are largely going off to work earning a wage and women are especially if they're middle class or higher staying behind um, at home um, you know and we have during this time the sometimes this time period is called the cult of domesticity um, so the idea that you know women were expected to invest a lot of time energy and effort in building a nice home um, having well-kept well-groomed well-behaving children um, and so um, this kind of shift away from the family being seen as this kind of economic unit is further reflected in the fact that you have the rise of the companionate marriage during this time period. So the first kind of beginning of, you know, you marry for a companion, you marry for love. Um, as opposed to, you know, you you marry for financial stability, financial purposes. As we come out of the 1920s and, and, you know, and then, you know, out of the Great Depression, um, 
some major shifts happen during the 1940s and 50s as we go into World War II and then come out of World War II. Um, this is where we start to see the beginning of uh, what we call dating. Um, before that, it was a, a process called calling, and you would call if you were a young man, you'd call on a young woman at home under the watchful eye of her parents, um, and you because you're calling on her in your at her home, um, it was also kind of publicly announcing, I mean, to her family and your community uh, that you have intentions, uh, you know, for her. Dating uh, moves outside of the home into the, you know, kind of uh, public sphere. You know, you're spending money, you're going to movies and restaurants and, 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 and clubs and, um, this represents greater freedom for young people, um, greater independence, um, and we also see the rise of the development of birth control, um, and so you also see dating and sex um, starting to happen, um, becoming, and sex especially, becoming less about pregnancy um, and reproduction and, and worrying a little less about pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy. Um, we know that during World War II, the average age of marriage marriage, especially for women, um, but also for men, dramatically dips and remains low even after the war. Um, and, and sometimes 1950s are presented as being this golden age. We have the development of the suburbs um, and this very idealized version of the nuclear family. Mother is homemaker, father is breadwinner. Um, and this kind of becomes the middle class model uh, during this time period. And it's worth noting that this was largely made possible because of the strong economic standing that the United States has at this time, uh, where you have most jobs paying what is called a family wage, paying men enough money uh, that uh, their wives did not have to work, um, and they were still able to afford this middle class lifestyle. But although this is not necessarily a widely known fact, it was actually this time period that we see our first major increase in divorce because certainly some of those rushed World War II marriages were not very happy post-war. Part of this was because people did not really necessarily know one another, um, but certainly part of this, as we now know, probably has something to do with what we now know about um, PTSD and soldiers. Um, but we, we start to see um, our first real bump in divorce rates. And this escalates in the 1960s and 1970s. So as was discussed um, in the gender chapter about feminism, it's during this time period that we have the rise of second wave feminism, the book The Feminine Mystique, you know, arguing that women were discontented um, because they were marginalized and kind of public life and this left them feeling uh, pretty unfulfilled. Uh, this was especially true of middle class white women. Um, but what we also see during this time period, especially once we reach the 70s, is the disappearance of the family wage um, in a lot of sectors, which means for more families, uh, the question becomes, you know, if you want to have this lifestyle, you have to uh, have both uh, spouses, both parents working. Um, and the concept of the stalled revolution, I'll talk a little bit more about in later presentations, but it's just the idea that for women in the 70s and even into the 80s, um, you know, they are increasingly going to college, they're increasingly, you know, holding jobs and working uh, part time, if not full time. Um, but in a lot of ways, the ideology around what was expected of them and their families in terms of being a homemaker, of being a dedicated mother, that ideology did not change. And so that brings us to today, the modern family. So it's worth noting that compared to previous time periods, um, the nuclear family today only represents about 7% of U.S. households, not U.S. family types, U.S. households. And that's because we have more adults living in non-family households than we ever had, um, either single uh, individual households or they're living with unrelated individuals, i.e. either as cohabitating uh, partners or in a lot of cases just as roommates. 27% um, of people in fact live alone. Um, this doesn't mean that people aren't 
marrying or don't plan to marry or want to marry. Most adults will still marry at some point in their lives, although um, they live alone longer because there is a rising age of first marriage, 29 for men, 27, 27 and a half for women. Um, but in addition to this rising age of first marriage, of course, there's also still a very high ch likelihood of divorce. So just because you get married and, and live with your partner doesn't mean that you may not go back to living alone at some point. Um, and of course, people are living longer, um, so there is also the possibility that, you know, for elderly women, um, their partners pass away, and then we have an increasing number of older women living alone. Um, just because people are living alone, waiting to get married, not staying married, um, Plenty of people, of course, are still having uh, children, and we do have more people living with single parents than in the past, but it's worth noting that for a lot of children, they still live in two-parent households, at least for some point of their childhood. And the rest of this presentation um, is less about, you know, what I want to say and more just about these really helpful charts uh, that this chapter provided you. Um, these comparison charts between traditional societies and then industrial, post-industrial societies, um, you know, it builds in a lot of the language that we talked about, you know, the role of extended families versus nuclear families, you know, what the functions are of, of, of marriage. Um, you know, who holds authority, you know, definitely used to be patriarchal and in, in some families it's still patriarchal, but you're getting more and more families where it's a lot more egalitarian um, compared to traditional societies where you had a lot more cultures practicing polygamy. Of course, uh, most cultures and certainly in America, uh, monogamy um, is, is, is the dominant form. Um, you know, how did you decide upon your spouse? Uh, arranged marriages, uh, once very uh, common, now much less common. Um, there are still some cultures where that practice um, is still upheld, but in more and more cases, individuals just choose their own spouses um, and then you know uh, now uh, people are ideally they go in they, once they get married they live on their own um, if if they do live with their families for a short period of time this is not expected to be the kind of um, ongoing enduring uh, residents. Um, instead, it's just kind of a pit stop until they can afford their own home, what we call a neo-local residence. And then finally, you know, um, in terms of descent and inheritance, you know, once again, um, much more likely to be bilineal um, and just can vary, of course, family to family. So this is a fairly short presentation. Um, the next two are going to be longer. They're going to be uh, tackling the five major shifts um, in family structure that we see in contemporary society.